Oh, look, these numbers are really ticking up. <laughs> wow. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to this joint event between the Black Fem Feminist Bookshop and Housemans. We're just going to take a few more seconds as people come in to join us. Please feel free to use the chat box to say hi and let us know where you're logging in from. Oh, we've got somebody in from Canada. Welcome from Canada and from London. Ooh, all over, <laughs> Nova Scotia, Gateshead, amazing, Luxembourg, fantastic. Hey, I saw someone who's in Edinburgh, yay. In Edinburgh. <laughs> okay. Right, so for those of you just joining us, welcome to this joint event between the Black Feminist Bookshop and Housemans. Um, just to remind you that tonight only our speakers are welcome. So you'll are uh, welcome, sorry, are visible. So we, you will only see our speakers and hear our speakers. Um, you will be able to ask questions tonight and participate in the discussion at the end, but we'll talk a bit more about that later. First of all, I'd like us to welcome our guests. So first up, we have academic, activist, broadcaster, Emma Dabbery, and also activist and writer Michaela Loach. So we're here to celebrate the publication of Emma's new book, What White People Can Do Next From Allyship to Coalition, published this month by Penguin, and it's already causing a storm. It's been described as a manifesto for meaningful and lasting change. Emma Dabbery is an Irish Nigerian, Nigerian academic activist, broadcaster and teaching fellow in the Africa department at SOAS and visual sociology PhD researcher at Goldsmiths. Her 2019 debut, Don't Touch My Hair, published by Penguin, was an Irish Times bestseller and published to critical and commercial acclaim. The book also inspired a national conversation about race and hair and has led to changing regulations in schools and in the British Army. A regular broadcaster on the BBC, Emma presented Back in Time Brixton, Britain's Lost Masterpieces, as well as the sociological experiment Is Love Racist? Most recently, she hosted Radio 4's critically acclaimed documentary Journeys into Afrofuturism, and I listened to that and it was amazing. Um, Michaela Loach is a climate justice activist, co-host of the Yikes podcast, writer and fourth year medical student based in Edinburgh. In 2020, Forbes, Global Citizen and BBC Women's Hour named Michaela as one of the most influential women in the UK climate movement. Her work focuses on making the climate movement more inclusive and focusing on the intersections of the climate crisis with oppressive systems such as white supremacy and migrant injustices. Her activism has been featured in the BBC, Vogue, Cosmopolitan, Elle and Vice. She uses her Instagram platform and the Yikes podcast to communicate the need for system change, climate justice and dismantling white supremacy. Tonight's event is organized by the Black Feminist Bookshop and Houseman's Radical Bookshop. So a bit about those two bookshops. The Black Feminist Bookshop, a radical space of literature, knowledge, and kinship. We are a collective of Black feminist writers, activists, organizers, educators, and healers working together to open an inclusive, accessible, and affirming bookshop for Black women, femmes, girls, and non-binary people. Through our pop-ups, events, and online, we sell feminist literature, text written by queer, LGBTQ people of color, women of color and other historically marginalized, marginalized voices, books written by undertold and underrepresented voices. We have a monthly reading group where black women, femmes and non-binary people draw on the works and legacies of black feminist writers to generate strategies for self and collective healing and liberation. We also come together with allies to create radical social change. Follow us on Instagram at Black Feminist Bookshop 
and sign up to our mailing list to be kept up to date on our progress plans and events. And I believe that the wonderful D is going to write that link for our mailing list in the chat right now. Yay, I can see it. For those of you who don't know Housemans, Housemans is an independent bookshop based in King's Cross in London since 1959. Houseman specializes in books, magazines, and periodicals of radical interest and progressive politics, focusing on subjects such as feminism, black politics, LGBTQIA+, the environment, and anarchism. We also host events such as this throughout the year. We will be reopening the store on Monday, so really look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in the shop. Please note, in order to ensure staff safety, we'll be operating a social distancing policy. So you may have to wait a little while to enter the shop. We also still have our online store at www.housemans.com. The Black Feminist Bookshop and Housemans would like to thank Damika from Penguin and Emma and Michaela's PR and management teams for helping us to organize this event. Now for some housekeeping. Emma and Michaela look forward to your questions and comments, and there will be some time at the end for the discussion of this. If you have a question for Emma and Michaela, please make sure you put it in the Q&A box and not in the chat, because if you put it in the chat, there's a chance that it might get lost. Um, in the Q&A box, you can ask questions anonymously, and you can also upvote for questions asked by members of the audience that you would like to see answered. In the instance of disconnection or technical mishap, please bear with us. We will be doing everything we can to reestablish um, connection and your patience is very appreciated. Thank you once again for joining us. We hope you enjoy tonight's discussion. And now I'm going to hand you over to our amazing guests, Michaela and Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, and that brilliant introduction. Um, Emma, I'm so excited for this. <laughs> like reading your book, I literally shouted multiple times. <laughs> like, go off sis. Like it was so on point in so many ways and so deeply challenging. Um, and I just, firstly just want to thank you for that and congratulate you for the fact that it has already in its first week been put on the New York Times bestseller list and the Irish Times bestseller list. So um yeah huge congratulations for that thank you so much it's not the new york times it hasn't come out in america yet but the, the sunday times <laughs> the sunday times the sunday okay. times and the irish times yeah okay but the american but releases in june cool okay, so one hopes <laughs> that the yeah, same thing it's, happens it's, there it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's, <laughs> it's honestly i found it deeply deeply challenging so someone who um exists in like a lot of online spaces which is something that you talked about a lot and um platform activism and online activism um i found a lot of what you said and and your criticisms of um of anti of anti-racism as it has been done in many ways um really deeply challenging and i would just like to hear from you what um what do you think are the kind of the biggest things holding back anti-racism work at the moment that's a big question to start with <laughs> Sorry. yeah no it's fine but I, my head just started like, I think my headphones are too tight and um, my bun is too tight. And then the combination of those two tensions with your question, my head just went, <laughs> um, but I'm grand, I'm grand. Um, yeah, geez. Um, so, okay, so as I say in the book, like I, okay, so in, in, in one way, what's happening now is like incredibly exciting and I've never seen such a thirst and desire um, for conversation about change and ha actually having you know race and racism as something that is being discussed in the mainstream rather than just being something like very fringe or taboo mm. that you don't talk about but what I worry about is that this we are presented with a historic opportunity I won't say it's unprecedented because that falls into that a historical thing that I think happens a lot at the moment. There, there have been other um, moments in, in, in time in mm. the past kind of few centuries where not where I don't want to call it anti-racist, but uh, liberation mm -hmm. around race and freedom has been kind of at the forefront of, of, of social unrest and, 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 and popular culture. Um, but I think that um what's happening now is there often isn't a connection with those earlier movements 
a lot of those earlier movements are very inspiring to me because they are centered more around collective liberation mm -hmm. rather than individual advancement and kind of uh, they they are interested often in you know the creation of alternative uh, and parallel institutions rather than focusing on inclusivity mm -hmm. in institutions and systems that are that have inequality um you know kind of embedded embedded into their into their function so i feel that currently as well um there's these conversations but even the term conversation itself you know has been elevated to kind of like an obscene status where it's we need to have that conversation we need to start to have that conversation and conversation almost becomes a replacement for mm -hmm. any type of like real organizing or or action and um another thing that i see happen a lot is um taking the concepts and ideas and even phrases from that past organizing that's more collective in its approach and seems to be more strategic and more focused on outcomes mm -hmm. taking concepts and words but untethering them from that radical and expansive environment in which they were created and having quite reductive interpretations of them that are used for kind of interpersonal the, the res resolution of interpersonal grievances rather than an, an attempt at kind of creating a mass movement that could really bring around systemic change Mm, mm. And and that links back to what you were saying about inclusion because I remember um, you tweeted a while ago about um, how the revolution won't be diversity in advertising campaigns, um, and then I think I wrote like a whole post <laughs> like after that because that there's this, there is this idea I think a lot especially online um, of kind of more represent of representation politics and more representation of, of people who hold marginalized identities in systems that are already harmful and that are harmful and that being liberation um when actually yeah you're, what you're saying is that's so far divorced from where you know, from collective liberation from past struggles and from past groups that we can learn so much from um yeah i just think that yeah i i that's something that i really resonated with in your book was especially around talking about inclusion um and challenging those ideals is that something that i've definitely been thinking about a lot yeah, like if we have um, systems that have inequality as fundamental to their operating, log operating logic, even if certain groups who experience exploitation and oppression manage to get their seat at the table within that system, the system still exists and it will be at somebody else's expense. You know, mm -hmm. the Irish were oppressed when they first went to... America fleeing the famine, which was, you know, a result of the British colonialism in Ireland that killed a million Irish and forced another Irish, another million to flee. And most of them went to America. They went to America and they entered into like a grossly unjust system that was initially discriminatory to them. But they got their seat at the table and did did well in material uh, in terms of material gains. But that didn't challenge the system you know the, the the boot was on the neck of 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 black americans and um and 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 other racialized racialized people so this kind of you know representational identity politics is 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 inadequate and is even in some ways strengthening mm -hmm. the the um the 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 power structures that we should be um challenging yeah because that really links to um so obviously i take everything from a climate lens which i, I see as a way which we can build co coalition so much more because yeah the climate crisis is something that impacts everyone um and it's some it's, it's an issue that we must kind of unite behind and that's something I'd, I'd like to touch on a bit later and one thing that um under kind of climate justice you see fossil fuel industries um putting a lot of of money into things called like social licensing campaigns or things that will give them a social license to exist. And so in, in that example, you can see how things that might seem like inclusion or seem like increasing diversity or, or this representation kind of politics there actually allows a harmful industry to continue to exist because people think this industry 
is ethical and great because they have an activist be on their campaign or they have like uh, more black people in fossil fuel in the fossil fuel industry when actually if that system itself is inherently harmful and able to continue that's where this representation can actually cause more harm um, right mm. <laughs> exactly exactly and even even in instances where it's not like where maybe it's not even so nefarious mm -hmm. and so actually giving a uh giving a, a um a diverse facade to deeply destructive you know processes it's still problematic in that this obsession with visibility is um you know something we need to be mindful of i, I would just love to read a quote from um mm. it's from the book but i'm quoting um a scholar an african a study of african um american studies called um george lipsitz mm -hmm. oh my god my mind just went blank his surname is lipsitz pretty sure oh my god he's like one of my favorite writers i'm so tired i've been having these conversations that so i can imagine um, like you're on the, the book like promo train. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so please 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 uh bear with me um yeah okay so um ba -ba -ba -ba, collective goals okay so collective goals seem to have been replaced by visibility Mm -hmm. Long gone, it seems, are the organized strikes of the black liberation movements of the 1960s. As Lipsitz notes, there is little evidence of the parallel institutions that were built then, the freedom schools, the community banks, the community land trusts, the breakfast clubs. Where's the program? Where's the consistent set of demands characterizing and unifying this current moment? Lipsitz continues, People will be seduced and bribed. I love this bit so much. People will be seduced and bribed by thinking that if they're visible, that their politics are viable. Mm. That as long as they live in an economy of prestige, the image of them acts as a simulacrum of reality. But he warns, ethnic studies can do very well while ethnic people are doing very badly. Or it could equally be ethnic influencers can do very well mm -hmm. while ethnic people are doing very badly. You know? Yeah, for sure. And I, I know that I, as someone who has a platform and has been been involved in conversations around um, a lot of this stuff and, and with brands, for example, for a long time, I remember thinking, oh, if this, these people would support what I'm saying and allow me to say whatever I want to say, that means that that's making progress. So that's great. But actually, they just want to co-opt those ideas in order to allow themselves to exist and visibility or kind of the propulsion of one individual to a higher standing doesn't really do much to the bottom line, like to people yeah. who really, really need change. And that's, and that isn't how we move in a collective. Like it should always be about the we and rather than about the I, and it should think how is, how is this action actually going to impact all of us as a community? Is this pushing the whole community forward or is it just pushing an individual forward? Um, I think there's, there's so much in there because kind of also what you're saying, it's not just, I also agree that it's, I don't think it's just the individual's fault. And too often we can put, I think I can blame way too much. I'll be like, I can't believe that person has done this. Like I'm let down by them. And it made me realize how much um, I've dehumanized other people as well um, to make them into an, like a product almost um, that I can dictate what is right or wrong. And, and I'm not really acknowledging how much systems play into this and like mm -hmm. how all of us live under these systems that manipulate us. Yeah, completely. And like the thing about capitalism is it's a system that you're compelled to participate in, you yeah. know? Um, so, you, you know, like sometimes, what's that meme that goes around and it's like um, somebody is, I think it's like, it's, it's got like kind of a, a 16th century peasant and he's really like put upon, he's carrying some heavy load and he's like, oh, like society is terrible and oppressive. We should try and change it. And then this little person pops out of a well and is just like, and yet you live in society. I'm very clever, you know? So like saying, oh, but you participate in this and that. So you can't actually be critical of these processes. Like one of the things I write about in the book is this, um, actually it's the, the idea, there's, there's, a, there's a, a quote I take from a tenant of ally, allyship, where, mm -hmm. where it says that ally has the choice as to like, an allies like aren't, I can't remember the quote off the top of my head, but it's something to do, 
it's something along the lines of the ally like having a choice about whether they're oppressed or not and I'm mm. like you know that's actually if it was a white ally okay they're not like experiencing racism mm. but they don't necessarily like have a choice we live in a system that we are like actually we live mm -hmm. in a, a system of capital capitalist exploitation that we are compelled to participate in in order to survive mm -hmm. you know so one of my issues with the kind of allyship and anti-racist like framework is that it kind of is decontextualized it, it, it's mm -hmm. often referring to things as though we don't live within this framework of capitalism as though we're just yeah. like autonomous agents with kind of, well not 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 us but certain groups mm -hmm. are autonomous agents with unlimited um freedoms that, that that that's not the case you know? yeah yeah the assumption that um like age the amount of agency that people have in a certain group is homogenous which just isn't yeah isn't true <laughs> and yeah. um and that's why you you talk about um kind of the idea of intersection intersectionality of struggles rather than intersectionality of identities and i think that that is something that is is really compelling and, and important for movements to and especially people who've learned most of their anti-racism from infographics to <laughs> engage with because not there's no homogenous experience of um people who hold different kind of identities like there is no homogenous black experience there's also no homogenous experience of other identities and we can't um and when we do homogenize them i guess we're we're undermining the reality of capitalism and how that um impacts people we're undermining the reality of other oppressive systems and in many ways we we let these other systems kind of continue to wreak ha havoc by ignoring the reality and expansiveness of the world yeah absolutely like there's become this like within this current like framework there's become almost like a fetishization of interpersonal privilege mm. um while class and capitalism are largely ignored mm -hmm. which like is completely the wrong emphasis mm -hmm. um a more radical orientation would um sorry one of my my children has just appeared um, uh, um so yeah what i was going to say was I, I yeah that that idea of like you know um privilege and trans allies like transferring their privilege and i just think mm -hmm. there's a lot of um lack of coherence or definition about what the privilege is mm -hmm. um because white privilege as you know kind of presented by peggy mcintosh which is i think the kind of definition that were that 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 is it, she's the one who kind of I don't know if she coined the phrase but mainstreamed the use of it in 1998 in her um essay unpacking the invisible knapsack mm -hmm. and then that has kind of yeah become increasingly mainstreamed over the past kind of I guess five years that kind of talks about you know the um the unracialized so whiteness is even though whiteness is a a construction, a, a racialized construction, um, the way it differs from all of the other racial categories is that white people are seen as unracialized. Mm -hmm. You know, they're seen as the default norm from which everybody else deviates, you know? Um, so white privilege is in that conception seen as existing without that burden of being racialized and all the kind of punitive and disadvantageous sorry disadvantageous um things that come that come with that mm -hmm. so if it's about being kind of racialized in a white body existing in a white body and being unracialized how can that be transferred to how can that experience be transferred to somebody who's racialized if it's more of an economic transfer mm -hmm. of of privilege that because the, the demands I see is more like, um, you know, access to spaces, access to resources, as it should be. But that should be framed as a redistribution of resources mm -hmm. at a far more like systematic level rather than framed as interpersonal exchanges mm -hmm. between individuals. You know, that's kind yeah. of a highway to nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so it all becomes it all becomes locked in this kind of in these interpersonal grievances, mm -hmm. you know, and online is just full of that. Like, I almost can't bear it. No, I, I, I to totally hear what you're saying here as well. Um, and I just want to read a bit where you, I think this is just under where you've just talked about um, the redistribution of resources rather than just talking about 
vague privilege and whiteness. Um, and you write that my fear is that much of the anti-racist literature is an iteration of the same process of maintaining and reaffirming whiteness. Little in the mainstream anti-racist narrative focuses on challenging the idea of white people itself. Rather, it takes the category as an unassailable truth with the emphasis placed instead on making white people nicer through a combination of begging, demanding, cajoling and imploring. And this was a bit I like scribbled. There's also many notes in this book, but I like, scribbled around because it, it really um, confronted me with how even though I in lots of my organizing work, hold these anti-capitalist ideals and, and, and would practice these and, and talk about coalition and everything. I was still um, in, in my online kind of world, enhancing this idea of whiteness whilst trying to like dismantle it, dismantle white supremacy at the same time um, by this, by making it just about interpersonal and by not focusing on like too much enough on the, the more structural side of it and the intersections it has inherently with capitalism. And, and I think that I was doing a lot of the like, just trying to make white people nicer. <laughs> and um, I was just really, really like um, hit by this, I think, and really moved by it. And I'm sure that a lot of other people who um, who read who have read the book so far and anyone who's watching this who hasn't bought the book yet, I don't know what you're doing, come on, hurry up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this was something that this, this like, I think it's a book that it's not, there are great quotes in it, but it's the kind of book you need to read the whole thing because of the context that's in there as well and the historical context. But that was that was definitely a, a, a quote or a bit that I was kind of arrested by. And I'd like to hear you um, speak a little bit on what you mean by enhancing whiteness um, through anti-racism work. I know that you talk about it within the book, but just like a little bit of context. Yeah, so I see a reinvestment in racial categories, not just whiteness. I'm also seeing like a lot of conversations about like race being biologically real. I mean, that's mm. something that is advanced. That's something that was interesting. So, okay, so race is invented in like the 1660s in colonial Barbados uh, in order to, first of all, justify the dehumanization of black people. Sorry, they, they're not black at this stage. To justify the dehumanization of Africans who are being enslaved, this notion of a black race that is inherently inferior is, is introduced and a white race that is inherently superior um, to justify dehumanization and enslavement of the group that now become known as black or Negro to use the terminology of the time um, because these Western economies, well, these colonial economies and the and the these colonies and the Western countries, the European countries that they are the colonies of, are becoming increasingly reliant on um, the, the 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 obscene wealth that's being generated by this by this enslaved labor. So they have to justify the dehu dehumanization of the workforce. The other reason, it's the, the other motivating factor is. In Barbados, you have a situation where there are indentured Irish who've been sent there as because of uh, English colonialism. Um, Oliver Cromwell is uh, is rampaging through Ireland and um, like killing loads of people and sending loads of people to Barbados as indentured laborers. So you have the Irish and the indentured Irish laborers and enslaved Africans working together on English plantations and sometimes Scottish plantations as well. And there's a series of uh, revolts where the Africans and the Irish come together and attack the landlord class. What the notion of white, what the notion of race does is to shut down those emergent, essentially class solidarities that are, uh, that are, that, that are, that are emerging because they're really threatening to the status quo. There's more of those people, there's more oppressed people. Um, and so, white people even who are indentured laborers start to see their fate and their future um more in alignment with other white people even if it's a class of white people who um who ex exploit their labor and again you see the same thing happen in colonial virginia um not long after that um after bacon's rebellion um where indentured english servants and enslaved africans come together this union of commoners and then they start to codify into law this notion of blackness and whiteness and bring in these really draconian laws that remove all any claim to any rights to people who are now who are now understood as black so that construction of race um is at the same it is from the same historical period that we're seeing the um 
form of capitalism that is, is going to become the dominant um, kind of world system okay so the origins of that racial construction um, are intimately linked to the origins of capitalism and part of that construction is to help consolidate consolidate capital essentially in in the various ways that I've that I've explained it is crucial that we one more thing to add so race starts to be kind of streamlined from that period and then it, the idea of a white race and a black race you know spreads throughout the world um in the 19th century, so in the 1800s, this is reinvested in through the advent of scientific racism. Now, scientific racism purports to show that, to demonstrate that black people are entirely different species to white people, and that this can be shown through these types of pseudosciences that take race as a biological truth. I am now seeing a lot of people talking about race being a, a biological truth and i'm seeing that in tangent and not necessarily separate from all of this anti-racism conversation that's happening so we are actually like you know in this time reinvesting in that truth status of a, a racial taxonomy and hierarchy that we should be that should be being dissolved you know stuart hall the great um Jamaican, British, um, the godfather of cultural studies. You know, uh, African Caribbean people have contributed so much to Britain. Like I, I, I reading that commission of on race and ethnic disparities report, it's on my desk now. And the way African Caribbean people in, in particular, I feel yeah. are, 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 are demonized in that mm -hmm. and are presented as, it's, it's, it's actually just really shocking. Mm -hmm. I think African Caribbean people, black Caribbean people have contributed, you know, if I can identify any group who've been like so influential, I think, you know, blackness is also a generic category that obscures mm. like lots and lots of differences. Mm. A group that's been so influential it are like African Caribbeans and not just in the more obvious ways, like, uh, you know, kind of music and youth culture where they've been massively influential, but also like intellectually in terms of literature, in terms of cultural studies, like so much of um, the framework of, how we understand and approach culture um, comes from cultural studies, which is essentially, you know, Stuart Hall, this Jamaican British um, uh, scholar, is the is 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 the godfather of. So Stuart Hall talks about the fact that um, oh, I've jumped off a bit. Yeah, he talks about the fact that um, he talks about loads of things, and I talk about him in the book. But now I've just tried to cram into <laughs> cram in too much stuff. Um, but yeah, so you're seeing this um, idea of race as like biologically real reemerging, and these kind of emergences of of kind of ethno nationalism, not just from white people. But you're also seeing in less extreme, you're seeing people just talk about black people and white people all the time as though those are really like cohesive and meaningful categories. Like my book is called What White People Can Do Next, but I immediately say like a couple of pages, it also, it could have been called What Everybody Can Do Next. Yeah, for sure. But that doesn't have the same impact, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, it says that, um, let, me, let me just read a tiny bit. I have to say as well, sorry, my answers are super meandering and that's yes, just, it's that's great. It's because just the way I talk. No, your brain is full of amazing things and they all just come <laughs> out and we love it. And we're all learning so much. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Um, so do, do, do my, my discomfort, my, dis, my own discomfort with the, with the title of the book that I've chosen. Um, <laughs> So, I was going to yeah. ask you about that actually, but we could do it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I chose it, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit more why. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Okay, I'm just going to read like half a page. Is that cool? Yeah, it. it might even be a whole page. I'll, I'll, I'll read quickly. Yeah, um. On. Whiteness is always there, ever present, determining who gets a chance and who is denied opportunity. But recently I have, I have been starting to visualize it like a horror film ghoul. It's looming in the shadows, it's threatening, but we can really activate it, energize it and empower it by saying its name three times in the mirror. However, once evoked, what the fuck do we do with it? If we summon it and just leave it at large, free to run rampant and unchecked, it's game over as we're all subsumed by its murderous rampage. 
Much like a horror film body, we should invoke it only to slay it. To slay whiteness and not to slay white people, okay? Let me be clear. <laughs> Without that second crucial part, we remain under siege, doing its bidding, enthralled to its promises and lies. This is one of the numerous reasons I increasingly feel a sense of reluctance talking to or about a generic category of white people. This book is of course called What White People Can Do Next. While I wanted to create a concrete and practical resource, the title is also a, provo is also a provocation. Nonetheless, I'll skip a bit. Nonetheless, it catches your attention, which is precisely the intention. We have to set whiteness up to name it, to frame it in order to disassemble it. While of course there are parallels and experiential consistencies between people racialized as white, the differences that exist between white people in different parts of the world are also vast. Before we even get into region, socioeconomic economic class, beliefs or political allegiances, I think that this diversity represents an opportunity to loosen the death grip of whiteness, mm -hmm. a concept that was invented to flatten those differences in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that happening, you know, in the mm -hmm. anti-racist conversations. I just see these unproblematic assumptions and instructions to white people. I'm like, who are you talking about? Yeah. You know, I think it even comes like for me from being Irish. Like I, I've seen things like, you know, white people turning down, you know, maybe like an MBE or an OB or whatever it's called. And then people being like, oh, that's just a performative, that's just a performative action to 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 be like an anti-racist ally or to 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 be to to you know kind of be widely performative for black people and i'm like not necessarily you know a lot of white irish people would mm. turn down that thing not because because they're not not necessarily because they're thinking about black people but because they are you know it's they're it's a post-colonial country in mm. which many people are anti-imperialist mm -hmm. you know um so yeah who are you talking about who are the mm. white people and, and that is such an important question um, because I have definitely just said statements like white people. Um, and I mean, really we, all is, we, we, yeah. we all have, we all have. And it happens to black people all the time. Like black people are always just seen as a, you know, yeah. a homogenous. But it's, it's funny because I would have an issue if someone tried to homogenize the black experience and yet I was doing the same to the white, ex to, to the white <laughs> experience and not realizing how that was undermining everything, a lot of things that I was saying. Um, and yeah, I think being challenged on that is, and, um, but that's why I think books are so great because if we focus, if we just leave everything to social media where it's all like sensationalized and it's all just dramatic and it's all about like making big statements and no nuance, then we're not really going to be able to challenge things and learn things and see the gray areas and the nuance that exists. Like everything isn't as clear cut and as uh, that social media and infographic might be able to see like 10 slides is not enough for any topic but, ever. But because social media, um, you know, because of the, okay, so because of the framework of kind of all of the platforms, things can have to be in a kind of um, mm -hmm. a bite-sized way, right? So that has its own issues. But then if you actually look at a platform like Twitter, like that actually like, you know, gamifies like outrage and highly emotive, like highly emotive and reductive takes um, are the ones that are more rewarded, you know, in terms of, uh, likes and and and, and reshares and because it, it because that's what your that, that's what your your aim the aim on those platforms isn't necessarily like collective change or liberation it's like becoming as influential as possible which is mm -hmm. like through growing your platform right and growing your platform is usually done the way it's set up you know on Twitter is mm -hmm. to be highly highly emotive and to like mm -hmm. charge people and to like trigger people you know mm -hmm. so that doesn't really lend itself to kind of like uh, careful and considerate discourse yeah it doesn't really lend itself to the reality of the world <laughs> as 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 not being yeah as clear-cut and and I, I recognize how um yeah, how much social media can just make us fall into these pitfalls of, of even exhibiting this same kind of behavior in in the quote unquote real world like with actual human beings in front of us um and still upholding or exhibiting this same behavior when it evidently doesn't make sense <laughs> like <I've, laughs> um and it can't be applied and i've and i've even seen within um like organizing groups that i've been a part of um how 
social media kind of discourse has, has come into these organizing spaces and caused actual harm and, and more division in many ways, because it's just, it can just be so reductive of, of the reality of experiences. And it can also just waste us time sometimes just arguing about things and not doing things. Yeah. And you know what, as well, loads of it, I see a lot of things that are inaccurate. Like they, they, they are, they are objectively like wrong. Okay. But then they become really popular. Mm. And if you want to be the person that points out that's wrong, <laughs> well, do you want to do that? Do you want to like have that pile on? Do you want to have that toxic kind of attack that you're, that, that you're running the risk of if you like step out of line, don't toe the party line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is one thing that um, we talked about on the Yikes podcast, the podcast that I um, co-host this week. The episode was on, we just started it as like a vague episode about things that have made us yikes recently. And we ended up really talking about how how much on social media you do get pulled into this like group think and that inability to step out or, or really challenge things without, but it's because it is kind of links this idea that through social media, and I think it's just a normal human thing that has existed for a long time, but we're unable to see the complexities of people, it's either we see someone as, as wholly terrible or wholly great. And there's no gray area in between it. So as soon as we see someone that even if it's someone that we really like, as soon as they do something wrong, we move them into the bad person category and yeah. we dehumanize them to that extent. And we just want to kind of rip them apart. And, and, that, and on social media, that happens on a huge scale because people are dehumanized even further. And yeah, I do think that it's this connection to our innate humanity which you do also talk about in the book that we need to like remember humanity and remember what makes us human and the connections that we have um with each other and move kind of a bit more away from just wanting to or this kind of binary idea or pulling people apart because in many ways it means that we just do we do just waste time doing that and we remove ourselves it also connects our, removing ourselves from nature and removing ourselves from the world as a whole as well Absolutely, absolutely. And also the idea that our racial identities somehow like demonstrate our politics as well. The idea, you're not just radical because you're black, you know, you can mm. be like a committed black capitalist and you're not not radical just because you're white. You can be a white anti-imperialist, you know, like again, I, I think of Irish revolutionaries like James Connolly, who I'm really like inspired by and they're white and they're radical, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, I guess that also then connects to the issue with representation politics that assumes characteristics that a, an individual from a group will hold. And therefore, if they step into a space, then people assume that that individual also holds those same politics as well. Yeah. And mm. um, one thing I want to um, also talk about, which I really loved, is that you connect everything to the climate and ecological crisis always. And you always bring back to that. And I think that that is is so great because that's what climate justice is. Climate justice is a principle which sees that all of these oppressive issues are linked and that they kind of intersect with the climate crisis and that the climate crisis is a great multiplier of all of these other issues. And so we must be aware of those connections and act in accordance with those connections and take a, a collective liberation framework to the actions that we're doing. Um, and one thing that you say is that the same forces that have a disregard for black life, for the lives of, in, of the indigenous, for the marginalized and for the lives of women are the same forces that disregard the life of the earth itself. Individuals who see themselves apart from other people, who imagine themselves disconnected from the natural world over which they short-sightedly assume mastery, who see the destruction and degradation of life as a fair exchange for the tightly policed boundaries of ethno-nationalist identities, the pursuit of wealth or the achievement of billionaire status. I remember I was like, woo, yes, <laughs> I'm so glad you said it because this is what, what, we, what we need in our movements generally is for it not to be like an, a book about race or a book about climate or a book about capitalism because all of these things are connected and it would just be, it would completely reduce these issues to act as if, I don't know, to, to talk about race without talking about the climate crisis in the current day it would just be bizarre to me, but it happens all the time. So that I'm so glad I'm so glad that you read that quote as well because I have noticed that I'm always reading it. So this is the first <laughs> time I didn't have to because you did it. So yay! And actually, I I am um, I was um, like asked who I wanted to like host this conversation to be in conversation with, and you were like 
I was just like, oh my God, I would love if Michaela was available and willing because um, I, I love the work that you do. You, oh, you thank know. you so much. I'm so touched by that. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's, it's true you gave me hope in that uh, uh uh online online space i mean i'm not i'm not wholly against like i'm very active online you know mm. um there's a lot of people i follow that i'm inspired by you, mm. you 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 being one of them so i'm not i'm not wholly against it i just am aware of its limitations and it's and it's dangerous yeah and also we should be able to criticize things without also then being put into that category of thinking it's wholly bad like we i think we can we can participate in things and 100 criticize them <laughs> right mm. of course and actually mm. you can criticize something because you love it mm. i'm not saying i actually like love <laughs> like platform capitalism but often the things that i bother to be critical of is actually because I care about them deeply and I'm really invested in them. Yeah, or you, you recognize know? the power that they have. This is for me, I think the reason that- Oh, I there's also I, that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I'm speaking for you, but the, the reason, <laughs> like, that's why I think I criticize social media a lot is because I recognize the power it can have. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think I write about James Baldwin a lot in the book and uh, you know he kind of always says that he, you know his crit criticisms of America come from his deep, connection to it from being American you know like that he's he's critical of it because he wants it to be better he wants it mm -hmm. to do better that's not my relationship to social media I'm not using that as an example but I'm thinking you know maybe sometimes <laughs> when I talk about racism in Ireland for instance yeah, yeah. um so sorry my light's gone really weird because I had to move it because it was actually just shining directly into my eye and blinding me your so, light is um, great you just, <laughs> semi blinding me um what were you asking me oh so the ecological um thing yeah so mm. the relationship between race and whiteness and capitalism mm. those systems that are kind of you know being created um in those in the early colonial period um are also um really centered around stealing the land from mm -hmm. the Irish, actually from the English poor through the Enclosures Act by the elites, mm -hmm. from the Irish. Ireland is like the, the, the test ground, the laboratory for like English colonialism. In the Americas, you know, from Native Americans, and then after that in Africa and in Asia. So one of the, that, that's one of, that, that stealing of the land and that idea of the land being used, owned, so the mm -hmm. land being private property that's owned and is used for productivity and is like ruthlessly kind of like exploited to create to create wealth, you know, that relationship to the exploitation of the land is intimately is intimately linked and the abuse of the land mm -hmm. and the separation from the land, you know, kind of that comes out of like European Western uh, enlightenment philosophy mm -hmm. and um, the re the destruction of the biosphere that is now looming comes it has its origins in those kind of like in that historical period and the systems that were put in place then so it's also intimately linked to all of this stuff and then obviously because there has been so much organizing around around the around environmental justice as there has been you know around race and the stuff around the, the earth and the environment is obviously something that like actually deeply and personally affects everyone. Mm. So it opens up new and I think exciting opportunities. Not that I'm trying to put a positive spin on climate crisis, but <laughs> exciting opportunities for new coalitions yeah. and new, new, new unexpected, you know, affinities between mm -hmm. people. Yeah, and this is one thing that I think actually is important to emphasize is obviously the climate crisis is is horrific and the impact it's having now is are horrific, but it also allows us an opportunity to enhance justice because a lot of the solutions to the climate crisis that that see it as a justice issue also reduce inequality globally and also tackle other systems as well of oppression. And that's why, yeah, I just think that it can actually be really hopeful when we see climate as a justice issue because it shows how it encompasses everything and how we can actually have the ability to to change things um, quite fundamentally um, because it is an issue that affects all of us and I'm recognizing that we can't um, we also can't we can we also we need to talk about the connections that climate has with race but we can't also just reduce climate to a racism issue solely because mm -hmm. for example in the scottish context um we work 
um, a group that I'm involved with Climate Camp Scotland, that we work with um, communities and especially like with workers and um, more like rural communities and working class communities who are being impacted by the fossil fuel industry now. And a lot of times they get ignored because there isn't as much of um, an emphasis on the impacts of the climate crisis on working class communities, like within the UK, and mm -hmm. especially how um, in the UK, like in the UK context, um, when it comes to climate justice, um, what class class issues are hugely important to pay attention to as well. Um, and what I hope is, I think it's so great that we're starting to talk about climate as, as a racial injustice issue, but we need to also expand that into all the other kind of oppressive issues and recognize how it isn't as, as simple or clear, or clear cut. And there is so much more nuance there and there's so much, it's so many intersections that we need to pay, part of, pay, pay attention yeah. to. And actually, actually, in the in the Scottish context, because um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking about whiteness as an erasure and a generic term that collapses crucial distinctions in order to consolidate capital. And I'm like, if white people are a relatively modern invention, who were white people before they were white? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be different if you're English, Irish, Scottish. It's going to be different what part of the world you're in. But then, in relation to the environment, um, I say I recently came across the word, and um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly because I've not heard it said. But I recently came across the word "ducos," "ducos," an ancient Scottish Gaelic ecological principle of interconnectedness between people, the land, and non-human beings. Ducos speaks to the type of coexistence and entanglement that we are now perhaps too late recognizing the utter necessity of if we are going to survive. These entanglements would be bulled over by modernity or by, mm -hmm. by whiteness, you know, the mm -hmm. imposition of whiteness. So yeah, like what, what kind of principles, what kind of ecological principles and understanding of the relationship to nature and the environment did people who came to be racialized as white have mm -hmm. before they came to be racialized as white. You know, I think that's, I mean, I love history. So for me going back into the past is always very exciting. Yeah, for sure. And and I I do really think that this connection, this, this disconnection actually from the earth is obviously inherently related to capitalism and, and, and how much the value that's put on certain things. And and all of these oppressive issues are extractive issues and capitalism inherently is, is about extraction. And extraction is how we've ended up with the climate crisis because extractivism and the impact it has on indigenous communities, but also on the, on the natural land and how it's also extracting our futures away from us at the same time. And many people mm -hmm. and extracting many people's present days away from, from, from them now. Um, and just like how, where value is put on. I think that's something that, yeah, we all must reflect on in climate. And it's not just anyone who's watching who might not be involved in climate stuff it's not just for science people <laughs> like it's not a science thing it's a justice thing as well it's a human thing it's it's one thing that can unite us in some way behind a cause and and it's I think it's definitely an issue where where you, how you talk about coalition building that's so deeply essential because all oppressed groups and all people need to come together and realize that this shit as you say this shit is killing all of us and when it comes to the climate crisis it, it's never truer than then that this shit is literally killing all of us um and we all must unite behind that and and realize that we all have skin in the game like it's not just that some groups of people who are like an amount of oppressed i don't know hierarchy of oppressed um that people will make out it's not like those people are the only ones who should be doing for it, it shouldn't be it's because for all of us and yeah. for the collective together um i think we should go to questions i've just seen that yeah. but before just before we do i'm going to say one thing really quickly actually in in the conversations that I've been having, most of my research, um, you know, has been has has been on race, mm -hmm. and uh, in, in more recent years on on capitalism as well. But I've really like I've I've asked to be in conversation with people that are um, far more knowledgeable about the climate or knowledgeable, you know, about kind of trade unions and that kind of organizing. Because I really do want to use this as a springboard, even for mm -hmm. myself, you know, to be in um, conversation with, in coalition with people, you know, people that have that, that, that other type of, a particular type of expertise that I want to learn more about. So I can also be more involved in those movements and mm -hmm. looking at kind of, you know, relating them all or integrating them all, all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um so the first question is quite a long one, so I'll just read it. Um, I'm often overwhelmed by the magnitude of the capitalist and patriarchal society that we live in. I love Audre Lorde's quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I believe this fits into, our, uh, into your abolitionist analysis. 
Where I struggle is in marrying is in marrying this with the climate change emergency, given the time sensitivity of it. How can we dismantle institutions while sim whilst simultaneously having no alternative framework slash system that is necessary to enact impactful change? Is that to you? What's my abolition? What is that to you? I don't I think it's I, more I think, about the environment. I, yeah, I, 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 I think it's more about capitalism and like about changing capitalism and dismantling capitalism and then how we can link that to the climate emergency. But would you, I can move on to the next one instead. I, I, no, let, let me try and give a quick, uh, yeah, a yeah. quick, it's not a quick answer question, but let me no, just no. try and give some sort of uh, uh, response. Um, so what I want the, what I want, what white people can do next, i.e. what we all can do next, um, is I really want the book to um, help people make connections with thing, between mm -hmm. things that they haven't maybe um, seen or thought about before. And I don't even really see a kind of widespread interrogation of capitalism going mm -hmm. on. And in fact, in lots of the anti-racist movement, I see a, um, a, a reproduction of its of its norms rather than a challenge of it. So mm -hmm. I can't, I just, I want people to have like, you know, a basic um, understanding of what it is, what capitalism is, mm -hmm. you know, and its relationship to um, racism and to systems of exploitation that affects us all. In terms of the pressing urgency of, um, of acting on the climate, because you will know this um, better than me, but I remember reading, and it's probably two years ago now, a report that was saying um, they, the, the, the estimation was there was maybe 12 years um, mm. to um, create the necessary change to kind of prevent pretty major disaster. And that would need a coordinated international effort mm -hmm. to start immediately. And that was two years ago, and I haven't seen any I haven't seen any evidence of that coordinated international effort. Um, so to me, the most powerful thing, you know, would be a pretty kind of rapid building of a mass movement, you know, mm -hmm. that look at the, look at the farmers in India. That's not something mm -hmm. I know a great deal about, but that's a huge body of, of, of people, you know, the, the, the recent protests there, if there could be like, there's so much thirst for change, you know, there are so many, there, there are so many kind of movements and protests. If that kind of built rapidly into like a big global mm -hmm. mass movement that is actually like a labor movement, you know, that that's um rather than just symbolic demonstrations, mm -hmm. but is actually like really putting the pressure on 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 on, on capitalism, you know, then we would be we would have more influence and more power in um having our demands met. First of all, yeah. we have to articulate what our demands are, even, you know. But yeah. Yeah, and I kind of just to touch on that as well, um, what it's saying about how can we dismantle institutions whilst also having to address the climate emergency. I think in order to like adequately address the climate emergency, we have to dismantle these institutions um, and these things can't be separated from each other. And what you're saying about movements, if we look through history, movements are what have created change, like change isn't a passive thing. Um, it's something that happens by being forced um, through disruption and and especially under capitalism disruption is around um, like causing economic disruptions is a way that you can do that or causing kind of disruption to um, so many different things and everyone who's also listening just join a movement in your local area and get involved and, and become part of that. This is the thing. P I, I hear, you know, people say, oh, I just want to be an ally. They don't even have black people in their immediate environment. Mm -hmm. I'm like, please don't go out of your way to seek out a black person to be their ally. Get involved in your local community yeah. and like do some organizing there. You know? Yeah, yeah. And get stuck in, because it's in community where we can create the most change. And also there will be issues that are very local to you and local to your community that you can be involved with. Um, and you don't have to seek out an issue somewhere else. Like you can <laughs> work at home first as well. Um, so the next question is what, this kind of moves on, but it kind of touched on already, but what kind of collective real world action would you like to see happening? So talked about movements. Um, yeah, I guess that kind of the same kind of thing, just joining movements, being part of movements. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll yeah. move on to the next one. <laughs> Um, 
If the main focus for liberation should be on structural change, how do we fight and dismantle a structure that is primarily dominated by and centres whiteness? I'm thinking specifically Parliament and the House of Lords, the criminal justice system, courts and prison, and the overarching capitalist system that we find ourselves in. I mean, we could start by voting for governments that are committed to combating inequality rather than voting for governments that are committed to enforcing the status quo and exacerbating racist tensions that would be that that would be a powerful starting point mm -hmm. um we don't seem to have managed <laughs> managed yeah. that um and when that hasn't occurred you know like look, look at all the kill the bill like mm. uh, organizing this happened and groups like sister and cut sisters yeah. and cut and how effective they've been in the last few weeks you know yeah yeah i think also like within that it's it's also not limiting the things that we're asking for as well and 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 this kind of links to what you were saying before about whiteness but um one thing that joe the co-host of the, the podcast that I present always says to me is to stop limiting my ideals of the future on the systems that already exist now and instead look beyond that. And so kind of within that, we, we, yeah, we can't just settle for how things are now and we should always be looking beyond that. Um, someone has asked a question about, um, so hi, question to both. Michaela mentioned that the book, um, that books are really useful for learning beyond social media, but what would you recommend for people who struggle to read academic texts but still want to learn? I've had friends say who say that although social media is limited, it's a much more accessible form of learning for them. Um, do you have any recommendations for access? So I made this like super accessible yeah. for that purpose. And most people have read it in a day, everywhere from an hour to like maybe the whole day, depending yeah. on their reading speed. So that was very much my intention mm -hmm. um uh there are people that will that so so my aim is to you know translate some of the theory and more obscure but very powerful ideas that are not commonly known on on social media and like bring that to wider audiences and again organizing in your community like if you mm -hmm. look at um the feminists um movements of the earlier periods, like 60s, 70s, 80s, they had um, the consciousness raising groups as um, central central to their, their mission. So they understood that not everybody was gonna read the theory. So the consciousness, tech, consciousness raising groups were conversations with those who had read the theory mm -hmm. and those who hadn't and going, going through it all in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, pe people that had that, ha that had read it and understood it, ex explaining and sharing that knowledge with those that were unable for whatever reasons to do that reading. Knowledge should be shared. This yeah. weird kind of idea as what well, this this kind of like this kind of also we live in this time. It's like Michael Gove. I think it was Michael Gove that um, was saying nobody wants to hear from experts, and you see that as well in the anti-racist movement. It's, it, it's sometimes as though, you know, if somebody has studied theory, they're, they're, they're almost held in, in suspicion, mm -hmm. you know, by, in some quarters. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the Black Panthers, who I reference a lot in the, in, in, in the book, they, before you could join the Black Panthers, um, you did a six week immersive uh, study course in, um, so you had the foundations of a political education before you, before you even started meeting with the Black Panthers. And these are not, pe these, this was with people that didn't have like, you know, academic privilege or advantage. These are like working class Black people in the hood, you know? So the idea that the only people that can read or engage with theory are people that have some form of e economic privilege is, is one I reject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would say that um, also sometimes I think people also sometimes make out that a lot of books aren't accessible when there are a lot of really accessibly written books that are especially I think um I think of books that are like interviews and conversations like freedom, freedom is a constant struggle which is like a collection of um interviews and conversations with Angela Davis that is super, because it's conversations transcribed it is like hearing someone talk so it is really accessible in that way and also there's a wealth of, of speeches that are out there that talk through yes. theory and yeah. and that you can engage with. And I think that that's something that is also really wonderful to do because I recognize that not everyone might be able to 
read books, but if, maybe if you're like an auditory learner instead, then that's a way that you can engage. Um, and audio books is another way. Um, I'd really recommend speeches. There's also, even on Spotify, they have like um, playlists of different speeches on prison abolition and things like that, which I find really interesting um, because it's an accessible way for people to jump in and get started and then maybe find something else. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm seeing someone say say podcasts and I was, I was a late uh, adopter of podcasts, but I'm a huge fan of podcasts, you know, and podcasts often, again, it's like what podcast you're listening to, you know, mm-hmm. um, but uh, podcasts, um I, I've seen like very robust and in-depth kind of conversations yeah. happening happening there far 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 uh, less reductive than what I might see on on social media yeah for sure because that, that's why um like we started our podcast was because we realized on social media a lot of the conversations weren't able to be as expansive as we'd want them to be and we wanted to have a space where we could define key terms and make it accessible and also have deeper conversations um so yeah I, I love podcasts I like obviously have some of the <laughs> motivation to love it because I'm so have one, but they are really great and there are so many out there. But again, in the same way, like we everyone needs to critically think about who is the host <laughs> and where is that information coming from. And it, it's absolutely, very so I, I I really enjoy Cornell West's um, current podcast, um, the the Tightrope, which he, mm-hmm. he it's Cornell West and a Trisha Rose, Professor Trisha Rose, I think her name is. Um, but um, and it's 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 on at the moment, so it's you know very responsive to everything that's happening currently. Mm. But it's hosted by Cornel West, who's like a, a a radical like black liberation, radical uh, black radical tradition scholar. Um, so you know those those conversations are happening with somebody that has a really like rigorous and robust and deeply kind of rooted intellectual and grassroots organizing background Mm -hmm. cool I I haven't actually listened to that one so I'm gonna have to check that out (laughs) after this that sounds really great um the next question is um what work in Ireland and the UK are you excited by just mix up a bit oh um Okay, let me focus on Ireland. Like, I mean, Ireland has um, gone through like so much change in the last few years. It's gone from like when I was growing up, still being incredibly socially conservative country, you know, where there was um, there was just very repressive, illegally repressive, not just like in terms of attitudes, but actually legally. Um, within the legislation, very oppressive, to being one, you know, where in the past few years there's been, like it's the the first country that had, um, you know, the gay marriage by like popular referendum, I think. Um, then the, um, the oh God, my brain is just like, oh, what am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, abortion um becoming like legalized like two two years ago oh my god somebody asked somebody said when don't touch my hair came out and they said the right year and I corrected them and said a different year because I've just lost like I'm just like what year is it you know like what's going on um but also um yeah like just Ireland having you know like grassroots organizing that has brought about in the past few years real substantive change and has Mm -hmm. resulted in a country that's actually you know uh, in many ways like far more progressive uh feeling than 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 here at present Mm -hmm. which is a complete reversal of how it was when I first left Ireland and Mm -hmm. um and and moved here here uh, (laughs) I'm seeing actually a younger generation um of I'm seeing like a younger generation who's maybe younger than a lot of the, it's almost like there's a generation of people that are more like neoliberal and representational politics focused. And then there's like a younger generation to them that I'm kind of seeing all these black, young black Marxists like coming up on Twitter who are like very, um, just very astute, mm-hmm. really, really like know the theory, know what they're talking about and are just like, like are just challenging mm-hmm. like a lot of the, a lot of the, 
stuff that one sees. Mm. And um, I find um, I, I, I find the proliferation of those voices mm. interesting, like mm. a radical, like a, a, a radical black movement. And also, that I don't even know that they're, they're not all. Yeah, lo lots of them are black, but they are, um, you know, definitely people that work with other radicals, irrespective yeah. of race. Yeah. Yeah, because that kind of, I guess that kind of links back to what you were saying about where to learn, because I know that I've learned the most when in community spaces through this almost like um, tradition of activism, of sharing knowledge within those spaces and interpersonally. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's really, and it's really great to see that there are other people who are doing that. I have a, another question. Um, as we come out of COVID and, or the pandemic, and are able to engage people in these conversations outside of social media, what are some of the more meaningful ways that we can have these conversations in a more nuanced way? Sorry, my baby just um, all right. Came, all right. just entered the entered the room, so I missed. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> um, I missed the question. That's as fine. the world go, as we, so come, out as of we come out of the pandemic, um, so COVID pandemic and are able to engage people in these conversations outside of social media, what are some of the more meaningful ways that we can have these conversations in a more nuanced way? I guess it like depends on the space. Yeah. You know, um, I, I guess like find out like what's kind of going on like locally to you and like get involved with some of those groups. It really depends like, I guess what the issue is, what the space is, but I think people like um, being in, um, the physical space with each other is a, a powerful antidote, you know, mm -hmm. to a lot of the excesses of the overemphasis of the digital sp sphere. I mean, we've kind of been, th that's been kind of unavoidable because we just had that minor issue of the uh, global pandemic to contend with for the past over a year. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel, I feel quite excited, I guess, about the energy that people are going to be bringing to, you know, kind of local local organizing like mm. i look forward to getting involved with more stuff yeah cool we love that yes <laughs> everyone just needs to organize get involved in <laughs> and love also it. i guess not everybody i guess uh, sometimes there's an issue there's this uh, this um idea that people have to like set something up themselves um mm. you can also like loads of people are doing loads of work i mean of course you can yeah. set up something yourself if th that need is there but there mm. might al already be that thing being done and yeah. being done well so join with people exactly and it's so much more efficient if there are already people doing this great work to just enhance and support that work um than to do all the work to create a whole new movement which is a lot um and i also kind of want to touch on on that question someone because there are conversations going on off social media even though we are apart physically um loads of people are organizing via zoom and online and people can mm. still join meetings like organizing hasn't stopped because of the pandemic it's just taken a different kind of way of doing things um so anyone who's you, you can still be involved in organizing we don't have to wait until the pandemic's over um it's happening now you can join a group and come to a like 200 person strong zoom call and <laughs> have a lot of technical difficulties but it's nice <laughs> fun. um so i i might be cheeky and actually ask a question myself because sure. i'm interested in um because I recognize that the nature of publishing is that you write a book and then it's been written a few months way like before you end up, it goes out into the world and things have changed and there are lots of different things that have happened. Is there anything that you, like if you were writing it right now that you would add in that you didn't add in um, when you wrote it initially? Um, I was actually writing it like right up to... <laughs> No, no, no. It was, it was written the bulk. It, yeah. So the, it was written, but I was like doing the copy edit okay. until like a month or so before it came out. But the, yeah, no, it, the, the, it existed since like late last year. What would I change? Yeah. I'd probably um, write something. I'd probably talk about the report in some way oh, wow. reference that. Um, although I also don't want to like kind of immortalize that. <laughs> I think it should be like, it should, it's ignored. Yeah. <laughs> or, or it's, goodbye. It's I heard bonkers. you on, I heard you on um, Nick Ferrari and you were great at um, <laughs> <laughs> holding your ground. Actually at one of our, um, we do telling your story trainings for activists and we use that as an example of doing a good interview and not letting someone like, wow. Over you. So um, thank you for that. Cause that was really helpful. Um, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I could just hear him. He was like, kept, he kept like gulping to try and like, <laughs> 
interrupt. That was so great. Is it? And you just were like, actually, <laughs> I know what I'm saying. And I'm going to like keep my cool and I'm going to be great. And it was amazing. We loved but, it. But I actually, in ter- to go back to your, to your other question, you know, I probably wouldn't. So yeah, the report, but like, I actually also try to keep things like not too reactive to every little thing that is unfolding because you don't want to kind of like, so, so, so responsive to kind of patterns of the moment, but not necessarily reacting mm-hmm. to like every new little thing that happens, you know? So I probably wouldn't write it that, mm. that differently, mm-hmm. even though like, you know, Megan and Harry was massive and that happened um, after I'd already written, the book wasn't out, but I'd already written it. So I didn't mention it, even though it was kind of like huge, but I probably still wouldn't mention it because the, 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 the dynamics that I'm talking about, it doesn't matter about the kind of necessarily the individual example, the dynamics hold true. The bigger picture remains the same, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, and that kind of links to what Toni Morrison says about one of the greatest functions of racism being distraction, because it it gets you to over and over again, like argue about your reason for being rather than getting on with the deeper work that you might need to do about changing systems and creating a different world. Um, so that is, that is an interesting point about like not being too focused on what's going on now and instead having a long game. And I guess that's how you have goals and how you achieve things. Is if yeah, you, yeah. And then there were things. Absolutely, I am really glad you made that comparison. And then there there were things like that I'd written about before, and then you know, kind of like I was saying that it's in everybody's best interests not just black people, but everybody's best interest to not have police forces that just mm-hmm. like kind of behave with impunity. Yeah. And then um, I'd already written that. And then we saw um, the protests around Sarah Everard and we saw these images of like white women being really brutalized, which isn't something that we're like really used to seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd already kind of written about that. And then like that example happened. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's about m- more writing about dynamics than individual yeah I really appreciated that because when we when we've been talking about um police and especially like the especially after the issue of sex ever ever there was we also need to remember that the police have also been a force of violence against white working class people as well um and the Met itself was founded to control working class people in London um and we yeah it's it's not just a a simple thing of of this or that it's it's way more complex than that Mm -hmm. um so this question kind of links the question that we talked about before about kind of about governments and, and systems, but it, it basically asks, do you feel um, positive that we can work to affect change when our, when our political leaders and systems of power are so invested in and often controlled by capitalist business systems, which are intrinsically patriarchal, racist and ableist? Yeah, well, I guess that's why, you know, you have um, organizers around black liberation trying to create like parallel institutions because they mm-hmm. feel that the um they feel that they don't want to be included in um institutions that they feel are like eth- ethically and morally bankrupt mm-hmm. so yeah <clears throat> i don't know and yeah that's that's, very <laughs> that's like quite a big question to ask <laughs> i think sometimes you just also just kind of have to act anyway and not be too demoralized i don't i know this maybe this is me um having some sort of um i uh, maybe too much um, naivety or something but I think there's a point at which we we kind of also just need to act as much as we can and not let the systems grind us down too much yeah um, and I also feel you know it's it's not just about everything that's happening externally it's also about like internally and there's something please go on with what you're saying while I while I look yeah no, no I was going to ask um a, someone someone else was asking a question um but would you like me to wait or ask this one um I think I can find this very quickly sorry okay. I need to just have the pdf <laughs> it's because I never know like I'm just being responsive so I never know yeah. what I'm gonna um I actually really want to share this bit because it's, um, I think it's useful in answer to that thing we were just asked. Sorry, just bear with me one moment. 
also everyone I'm sorry if you can hear whistling wind um Edinburgh is very windy and <laughs> oh my god whistling wind sounds so like evocative <laughs> <laughs> the whole time it's been so blurry outside um and I'm not sure if you can hear it but I can hear it quite loudly <laughs> I wish I could hear it um okay hang on here we go almost there Okay, yeah, here. Um, so, mm -mm -mm. yeah. Um, in the undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, Moten, Fred Moten and his co-author Stefan O'Harney articulate the right to refuse what has been refused to you. They call this refusal the first right, and it is a game-changing kind of refusal in that it signals the refusal of the choices on offer. Sometimes I don't get into like online debates because I actually like refuse the framework. You know, I'm like, I, I actually reject the framework that's being used. Mm -hmm. So it's not that like, um, yeah, so this is th this, this refusal. Um, it signals the refusal of the choices offered. It is in this refusal that we can reshape desire reorient hope, reimagine possibility, and do so separate from the fantasies nestled into rights and respectability. To paraphrase the philosopher and post-activist Bio Akamolafe, fugitivity is the radical counterpart to inclusivity within the dominant framework of oppression. You know? So sometimes I don't like the system, but I also don't like the way the challenges to the system are being presented, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this kind of, um, I guess, kind of links to the next question, which is more about academia and, and university. Um, so what would you like to see in academia and university settings for them to move towards a decolonized university experience and research? Oh my God, in that report, it talks about decolonization as being um, banning white authors and having a tokenistic kind of reference to black excellence. And I'm like, that's not what decolonizing no. is. <laughs> um, okay, so I did most of, so my, my, my PhD is at Goldsmiths, but my degree and master's are at SOAS. And I was uh, in the Africa department and teaching in the Africa department for a long time. So I, in, in my African studies degree, you know, I was actually dealing with um, African theorists mm -hmm. and um, African indigenous knowledge systems. And not only does that provide alternative and different information, but it also um, demonstrates different ways of um, different methodologies for um, approaching um, knowledge construction for opposing for for approaching for different different epistemologies sorry i'm going i'm going like i don't know now i'm going into like academic speak but so epistemology is not is not as knowledge construction okay so there are eurocentric kind of ways of constructing knowledge and there are like more african centered and indigenous ways of di diverse i don't mean diverse as in diversity and inclusion i mean diverse as in different to each other um, ways of constructing knowledge and I actually try and introduce that a little bit in the book you know where I say um in the bit read 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 and dance mm. um I talk about the way so yeah there are sources beyond books too European mm -hmm. enlightenment thinking privileges distance and judgment over other ways of knowing. So we need to think about using senses beyond the problem solving level. Ron Ware and Les Bach urge us to strive for a democracy of the senses, to think less with our eyes. They describe musical cultures as fertile breeding grounds for anti-racist dissidents. A little bit more. The black radical tradition can be found in black expressive culture. So it's not just in books, but it's also found in black expressive culture, particularly outside of the mainstream, where the most profound expressions of freedom are located in roots reggae and dub and jazz and techno and house and hip hop. Sometimes not in the lyrics, but in the sonics. That's one of the sites where the movement is liberatory, where it is black as in fugitive. So to go back to decolonization, European enlightenment thinking, you know, which sets the kind of the Eurocentric canon, uh, uh, me the methodologies within that privileges a particular type of objectivity and a a approaching of knowledge. Um, there are 
uh, methods that come from, like in Don't Touch My Hair, my previous book, I try and I, I talk about pe how people, African people, other people who um, have oral, um, uh, oral knowledge systems, you know, where there is, they say there's a, a, a proverb from somewhere in East Africa, I think that's like when an old man, or maybe it's Mali actually, I can't remember which country, but when an old man dies, a library burns down. So these human beings that are these deep repositories of, 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 of knowledge, you know, that they have studied in like a formal setting, but in an indigenous formal setting. So decolonization is not just changing the information, but also looking at different like methodologies for approaching both knowledge construction and knowledge dissemination. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that does make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, um, we actually, so we only have five minutes left. So I will ask, kind of one question to close, um, which I'll summarize a bit. So someone's basically saying that um, a lot of people who've come along to, to this event probably have come because they already care about this stuff to some extent. Um, how do we, I, I'm not sure how I feel, sometimes I feel a bit weird about echo chambers because I feel like we already existed in echo chambers before social media and it's people make out as this new creation when actually we would use previously would just know the people that we Ex lived around but how do we um expand these conversations and for example get people outside of these particular circles um to read your book and to engage in these ideas so i've already had like a lot of people contact me in the week that the book's been out um from they've either they either heard like a podcast where i've been talking about like the themes of the book uh and they haven't like read the book yet but they've heard some of the conversations and they've said and then they've gone and read the book and then they've said they've said that um uh they actually have come away feeling more invested in and empathetic towards issues that they were kind of a bit more resistant to before mm -hmm. and also that where they feel i've had a few people say this where they feel in the past they've been kind of being being called out mm -hmm. um, and that's made them get defensive. Mm -hmm. That the way this has approached material has actually made them feel involved and invested. Mm -hmm. And and then they, they're not getting defensive and then they can have a different engagement. And it's mm -hmm. not about sugarcoating things. The book doesn't sugarcoat things. The, okay. the book is the, the, the book really, you know, talks about the construction of whiteness and like the, the, the violence of that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not like kind of trying to placate anyone, mm -hmm. but I, I do think it's a more inclusive um, vision that is, it, it, what I'm trying to create is something that is compelling mm -hmm. to broader amounts of people than a lot of the current anti-racist conversation, particularly with its kind of fetishization of interpersonal privilege is. I think the current conversation, in fact, um, uh, alienates so there's lots of people that are not lots of people there. There's, there's, there's groups of people that are just, you know, committed and extreme racists. And I'm not mm. necessarily talking about them. I'm talking about people that could be otherwise persuaded, but become alienated mm. by the current framework. Discourse. Yeah. 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 And I guess, um, I think that there's a lot that I, as someone who a lot of my activism is in communication and, and trying to get people on board and onboarding people. Um, I think I learned a lot from, from the way that you communicated these issues in this book on how we can better communicate and, and involve people and move towards like coalition, which is what you talk about a lot and what we should all want, especially in a world that is facing climate collapse and a world um, where caring about these issues is, is so incredibly important um, and that we all need to engage with them and all need to be involved. Um, and bring people in, in many ways. But yeah, and as you said, not in a way that um, placates people, but in a way that challenges people in a way that is moving towards unity and coalition in some way. Yeah, um, in a way that we can actually see the, the interrelated nature of different struggles and yeah. that, um, you know, people are investing in not out of some act of charity or benevolence, but because they actually like want their own lives to be better too, yeah. and not at the expense of other people. Because your life being better at the expense of other people's or at the expense of like the environment is like super short term and like bullshit, you know, it's actually ultimately going to be destructive for you as well. So mm -hmm. it's about getting people to see things in a more, it's not even that hard, like just in encouraging a more kind of expansive uh 
understanding I think of things and also just like identifying ways in which like different classes of white people also experience forms of like like also have their life opportunities diminished you know so that they can also see a, a personal investment in making things better one of one of the things that um whiteness did was to kind of like hoodwink people into like uh, the a concept of whiteness kind of hoodwinks people from distracting them from all the kind of damaging uh, e extractive kind of like um nature of the systems that it also imposes you know mm -hmm. it emboldens these systems i guess in so many ways and allows them to continue because there's yeah there's this falsehood that it's benefiting people <laughs> actually it's harming all of us um yeah. it just it might just look different in the way the harm is caused um and i think that is a great note to end on thank you so much um for having me in conversation here emma i'm like i'm obsessed with this book it's so good <laughs> i'm upset i've told everyone i remember i was reading it um on one of my shifts at the hospital and i was saying to all the doctors like it's got to read this ignore like maybe ignore the title a little bit but you've got to read this because it's it's going to call you in it's going to challenge you and it's going to make the world a better place and i think this is what our movements need right now this is what the world needs right now and i'm not being this is not hyperbole i think this is just in, incredible and great and important and i thank you for giving this gift to all of us um and thank you everyone thank you so much thank you so much and you, you were like an early reader <laughs> um so seeing your in incredibly like encouraging posts about it was um really really affirming um because i was actually really nervous putting this out into the world because it challenges a lot of sacred cows mm. um from a place of like you know really wanting things to be better but i i i, I yeah when, when when the um the the positive reviews of which yours was was an early one started to come in it was very affirming so thank you <laughs> well i i hope you can see everyone in the chat also sending so much love um and everyone if you haven't bought the book yet go and buy this book i cannot recommend it more <laughs> i've literally been talking about it every single day since i read it so um, please, please go and buy the book. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Hausmans, and thank you to the Black, Black Feminist Bookshop for having both of us as well. Um, and to more conversations, to collective liberation, and to coalition building and futures. Thank you. And also, like having some fun along the way. Yes. Like uh, joy is Dancing. like centralized in 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 some of the conversation as well. Because I don't like this po-faced. Oh, it's a serious matter, so we have to be miserable. Yeah. No, we don't. As you say here, joyful. a revolution without dancing is not a revolution worth having. And I love that as someone who loves to boogie. So, <laughs> so you good so to be in conversation with you, Michaela. Thank yeah, you. So great. And I, I hope we can chat again soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>